for hundreds of years, long before the arrival of the white man. The Hopis have been living in their own way, an equivalent of the Christian ideal. The chronicle of Hopi religion and prophecy is preserved in pictures carved on rocks. This is a copy of a rock carving near Oribe. It shows the basis of Hopi prophecy, which speaks to and about the entire world through symbols. The figure at the bottom is Masawa, the great spirit, and he holds in his hand the reed by which the people emerged into this present world. This square represents the land which the Hopis finally reached. From here, there were two possible paths for them to follow. The spiritual path is never-ending, promising abundance and long life, shown here by the combination cornstalk and planting stick. This path leads to the great spirit and the life beyond. And this is the short materialistic path. The figures have lost their heads. With judgment impaired, they desperately seek fulfillment in any direction, only to end in ruin. In 1890, with a population of over a thousand, Araibi was by far the largest village and also the most resistant to the programs of the American government. In that year, Lololma, the village chief, was invited to Washington to meet with the representatives of the federal government who were anxious to gain his support for the government school. Lololma agreed, not knowing his decision would divide his people. The children would go to school in Keems Canyon 40 miles east of Araibi. However, school attendance remained low, and the reservation superintendent decided to embark upon a more aggressive enrollment policy. With a contingent of troops from nearby Fort Defiance, he entered Araibi and kidnapped at gunpoint 104 children, driving them in wagons to Keems Canyon. Once in school, they were put through a rigorous program to de-Indianize them. They were forbidden to speak their own language or wear their own clothes. Even their hair was taken from them. Tension developed and increased between traditionals and government supporters. And by the turn of the century, relationships were at breaking point. In 1894, 19 traditionals were imprisoned in Alcatraz for refusing to send their children to school. The government labeled them hostiles. Six years later, in 1900, Lololma died, a disillusioned man. But he was succeeded by Tewa Tewa, who continued to support Washington. On September the 7th, 1906, Araibi exploded. Traditional men, women, and children, led by their chief, Yukioma, were driven out of the village by the government supporters. After declaring Araibi cut off from the path of the Great Spirit, Yukioma and 300 traditionals walked away from their homes taking only what they could carry. They traveled west for seven miles, camping at Hope Villa Spring. And it was here, in spite of the hardships of winter, without adequate food or clothing, that the new village of Hope Villa was born. The center of religious orthodoxy had now passed from Araibi to Hope Villa. And as the new village grew, Araibi fell into decay. The traditionals thought they could now live in peace, following the Hopi way of life, away from the disturbing influence of the progressives. They were wrong. Within two months, Yukioma and most of the adult men of Hope Villa were arrested and imprisoned. They had again refused to sign statements allowing their children to attend the government school and again the children were forcibly removed by troops. Such roundups, as the government agent called them, continued until the early 1920s. Today, Hopi children are collected in buses and driven to schools in the progressive areas of the reservation. These children may enjoy their school experience, but their parents have different memories. Back there in 1927, we were to go to school and learn the white man's way of life and uh, 
we were taught that our whole way of life was wrong, that these things that the Hopis did was heathenism, paganism, and the bureau schools discouraged the whole Hopi culture. And then our language was discouraged, and there was always a whip or something behind you. You just didn't speak Hopi, and you went through that whole system from grades 1 through 12, and you get brainwashed into their way of thinking uh, that was all towards having the white man's material things, but it didn't give us any foundation to live by. Later on, they wanted us to decide for ourselves just what we felt was right in the Hopi way of life and what is wrong and that we should be the deciding factor. And uh, so then you just, you know, begin to wonder, because then they tell us, preserve your culture, preserve this, preserve that. And then I ask, what in the world do they want us to do? What are they trying to do to us? Because, you know, in all the other times, you know, they've uh, told us that it was all, you know, so wrong, and then now they want us to preserve it. The same schools that once attempted to eliminate Hopi culture may now be determining what is to be preserved. But the fact that Hopi children are encouraged to practice Indian social dances or to use traditional religious elements in their artwork may ultimately prove more damaging than the old repressive school policy. Our Hopi culture is so uh, complex that the whole year round is based on religion. We have ceremonies, rituals going on almost every day, every month of the year. And so the teachers come out here who might have been teaching in the public schools or else off our reservation schools where there is no, uh, no interruptions because of a custom, except maybe holidays and vacations, this sort of thing. But out here, we still have our traditions, culture, which calls for maybe uh, any time during the uh, week, something is going on. The student must be there to participate. And this makes the student uh, miss the class or miss the whole day of uh, work, which makes the uh, teacher uh, kind of in a problem because he has to go back and reteach the students that have missed the uh, lessons. And this is what they don't understand. <laughs> 